And what's amazing to consider by way of comparison is that Nick Saban is older right now, today, than Paul Bear Bryant ever got to be. He died at 69. This Halloween, with the Tide in the middle of a bye week getting set to go to Baton Rouge, where he won the first of the seven titles of the Tigers, Coach Saban will turn 71. For the Big Ten just announced its new media rights deal. Seven years of CBS Fox and NBC begins in 2023. The multi platform dream believed to be the largest in the history of college athletics. Welcome back, everybody, to episode 18, season number three. Thanks again for listening. I was hoping to get this uh, earlier this morning on Saturday morning. I think this is going to be released on Saturday night, but unfortunately, I had some things that came up. But anyways, uh, we have Zach McKennell on for the third time to talk about college football. As you know, this week was week zero, and next week is when week one officially starts for college football, so I wanted him to come on. We talked about all sorts of t college football things like, of course, the Big Ten's new TV deal, um, also conference realignment. We also talk about Nick Saban's new contract extension, uh, three sleeper teams. We also talk about Georgia and Alabama, Bryce Young and Will Anderson. We mentioned them as they're both coming back. Uh, we also talk about North Dakota State, about a possible chance for them going D1 or going FBS instead of FCS. They are Division One right now um, because he just recently interviewed the athletic director for North Dakota State, so that was really great. Again, Zach McAdoo from the College Football Blue Bloods podcast. I think it's called the Blue Blood CFP podcast. But again, you can just check them out. All the links should be down in the description below. Again, this is, I think, his second or third time coming on. So I'm really grateful he was able to come on and it went well, really well. So again, don't forget to check out the Blue Bloods College Football podcast. And as always, we have some other things as well. Um, but again, don't forget to check out our YouTube channel and a TikTok as we are uploading videos all the time. It's now Sports Town and just have the Sports Town podcast. I think the URL though is Sports Town underscore network. But again, go check that out. Again, don't forget to check out Zach McKinnell, the Blue Bloods College Football podcast. He interviews a lot of people, as I just mentioned. He interviewed the North Dakota State Athletic Director. He's also interviewed some college football players. That includes Louisville former quarterback Jawan Pass. So again, don't forget to check out the Blue Bloods College Football Podcast with host Zach McKenna. And I think that's pretty much it. So let's get on to the episode. Before we start today's episode, I'd like to give a quick shot to our sponsor of today's video. And that sponsor is our good friends over at HelpYouFind.me. You're probably asking yourself, JJ, what does help you find dot me? Well, I'll tell you what it is. Peter Sanchez, the founder, creator, and owner, was originally worried about his daughter and his mom always asking him for his travel details. Help you find dot me was initially created for collective peace of mind. 48 hours. These are the most crucial or most critical moments to find you in the event of an emergency or worse, waiting for the legal process to access your important history information, which can take up to weeks upon weeks upon weeks. With help you find dot me, you have your own secure and encrypted digital if I go missing file that can give you your most trusted people access to virtual information much sooner than the authorities. Each person you share with that has your has its own access rules and everything is completely encrypted. Not even help you find dot me can access it. This puts you in total control of your data. You can also update your location, submit photos, screenshots, and post random information or notes on the go. It's as easy as texting with a friend. To find out more information, go to help you find dot me. Also, don't forget to use the promo code down below in my description. If you use the promo code STP2021 to get 15% off your first order. Again, that promo code is STP2021 to get 15% off your first order. And go to, uh, if you want more information, go to helpyoufind.me. And again, I'll put the link down in the description down below. All right, let's get back to the show. And now, on to our interview with Zach McKennell from the Blue Bloods College Football Podcast. All right, I am pleased to be joined by a reoccurring guest, Zach McKennell, host the College Football or host the Blue Bloods College Football Podcast. He's come on a few times. Thanks again for coming on, Zach. 
Hey, absolutely, man. I appreciate you having me, man. Big fan of the show. Glad to glad to be on here, man, talking college football. It feels like this all season has lasted, you know, over a year, man. It's been it's been crazy. Yeah, it's been I mean, what actually I think either this week or next week college football starts. I think some places have already started now. I know high school football a lot of times around the uh, states has already started, but uh yeah, college football right around the corner and um the NFL season, of course. But uh we're here to talk about college football. Um, you've been on a few times, so probably most people know about your podcast, but if you want to talk a little bit more about your podcast, about your upcoming guest, and you've had some big guests, I know, recently. Um, but yeah, if you want to talk more about that before we start diving into college football. Yeah, man, uh, you can find us, uh, the Blue Bloods, on YouTube, all podcast uh, streaming platforms, man. One of the only shows that covers FBS and FCS will be, um, as an organization, voting in the FCS Stats Perform poll, voting for the Player of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, Coach of the Year, Freshman of the Year, everything like that, man. So that's a big honor. We just had an interview with uh, North Dakota State Athletic Director Matt Larson, talked a little bit about North Dakota State possibly moving up and some things going on there, man. Um, already dropping week zero previews, man. So uh, anything you want to know about FCS to FBS football, you can find us on YouTube, podcast platforms. We also have a website now, thebluebloodspod.com. All right. Again, thanks for coming. Again, you can uh, check his uh, podcast and all of his links to his show right down in the description below, or it should be at least. So um, I, I won't forget it, but hopefully I don't miss anything or something like that. But again, that's interesting. You know, you brought in the uh, North Dakota State uh, AD and um, there's been talk about them for a long time. I know we we didn't really talk much about this before, but um, if you want to kind of talk a little bit about North Dakota State, the chances of them going to FBS, I know there's been a lot of talks of it. They pretty much dominated uh, the FCS, but uh, within five to 10 years, could you see them making that move? Yeah, I think that's a good time frame. I think a lot of people, what people mistake is football success leading to the entire university and the entire athletic mm -hmm. department moving up. And when you look at their financial structure, North Dakota State still not even a top 10 budget football team in the FCS. So they're doing this and they've only been FBS since 2004. So they're a very young FCS program, too, and experienced almost immediate success. And I think what people like what I said, people see the football team succeeding, but they're forgetting that if you move to the Mountain West, if you move to the Mac or wherever you decide to move, you still have to bring basketball. You still have to bring, um, you know, women's basketball. You still have to bring softball, baseball. Uh, hockey is a big thing for them, too, mm -hmm. in North Dakota. And when you look at the geographic footprint, North Dakota really doesn't fit anywhere. Their travel costs would skyrocket traveling to travel to like San Diego State and Hawaii in the Mountain West. You got to go travel all the way to the East Coast in the MAC. And so the Dakotas are just in a weird place, man. And it's not a TV market. As we've seen, TV market drives conference realignment. I don't know if Fargo, North Dakota is a, is a TV market. A lot of people are looking to gain. And so they're just kind of left in limbo right now. But like uh, Matt Larson said, the athletic director, he said, um, we're going to do what's best for our program. If that stay at the FCS and win as many national titles as we can, we're going to do that. If an opportunity presents itself at the FBS Power 5 level, he's like, we'll do that. He's like, our goal is stays the same as to win championships. And so I think they're focused. I think it's all about – finding the right situation because as we've seen there's a lot of teams who have made bad financial decisions trying to jump to fbs trying to jump to new conferences and it impacts their program for years to come and I, that's not something the north dakota state you know administration is looking to do right now that's interesting i didn't realize that it was it was not till 2004 when they made the jump to fcs so that's a, that's a very interesting topic as well and i guess there's a possibility i didn't even think about you know the dakotas being kind of in a bad spot um, the Mountain West made a lot of sense, but yeah, you have to play San Diego State. Um, now, I know the Big Ten is starting to bring in uh, um, teams in California. We'll talk about U USC and UCLA a little bit later. But yeah, that's interesting with North Dakota State. I, mean, I guess they could be independent, um, but that would be kind of a little bit harder to do. But still, it, I mean, yeah. it is interesting. So it, It's a recipe for disaster, too. I think mm -hmm. independent, the only teams that have been successful are the BYUs and the Notre Dames that have the mm -hmm. funding behind them. And, you know, you mentioned the Big Ten expanding that far. The athletic budgets just don't compare. And really the best geographical fit for the Dakotas would be the Big 12. Mm -hmm. And. I don't think – I think we both can agree, knowing college football, there's not an FCS team as good as North Dakota State is that's ready to jump to Power 5 mm -hmm. and just completely miss Group of 5. But if there's a school that potentially could do it, it's North Dakota State who they won eight D2 national titles and then had to jump to FCS, and now they're 
on track to potentially win their 10th this year and mm-hmm. whereas a consensus number one uh, team this this preseason? Yeah, no, I guess there was two. There was also talk about their stadium being too small, but I think Northwestern yeah. has only a what size of 40,000. And is North Dakota State, what are they, 30 between like, 30 and 35? No, they're, like the dome only holds like, I think, 20,000. Okay. Yeah, or so just that's under really that. small. And it's hard to expand a dome. You would have to rebuild the entire structure. And they just, uh, the state of North Dakota is something that you guys can go listen to in the interview. He talks about how the state does not fund privately owned, so the schools, any athletic facility upgrades, the state will not give any money. So Mm -hmm. they just built an indoor practice facility that they raised $50 million to build that of just booster money and private donations and, and things like that. So that would be a big thing, but the Fargo dome, I think is the next thing on the list. And if they were going to potentially move up, uh, that's something they would look at, but the NCAA requirement only says you have to have an average attendance of 15 K but if you were going to make that move to power five, you probably would want somewhere closer to 25 to 30 at minimum. Mm-hmm. If you're going to try to jump to a conference like the big 12. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, I didn't realize it either, but that is a very, it's an interesting really point because it seems like they're kind of in a bat and a really tough spot. They can continue dominating, but I feel like people are going to pressure them possibly into moving. Um, but we'll see what happens with this conference realignment. But uh now, speaking of conference alignment, uh, Big Ten made a massive deal. Of course, they signed US or they got USC and UCLA to come. I think it's 2024 now, if I can remember right. And then they also signed a massive deal with CBS, NBC, and uh, Fox. And it seems like they're also trying to get Notre Dame to come in. Um, but uh, what did you think about that TV deal? And uh, yeah, just what did you think about the TV deal in general? I mean, I, I think it was expected. I think they still mm-hmm. probably got a discount, and I've heard that if they add a Notre Dame and Oregon or something like that, they could be pushed upwards of 10, uh, 10 billion. And um, I wouldn't be surprised, but if they add Notre Dame and Oregon, they would have 13 of the top 50 like college football TV markets. There was a study done where they took the last five seasons and ranked all the teams in terms of average viewers per week for the last five years. They would have 13 of the top 50. With Oregon and Notre Dame. And if you add Washington, you're talking about 14 of the top 50. And they have three of the top five if they added Notre Dame. So it it makes sense. When you look at the viewership, when you look at the TV markets that they have have now acquired, you you have the Maryland area with Maryland Rutgers and those in those northeast schools. You have the Midwest with the Ohio States, the Michigan, the Michigan States, even the Iowa's over there in, in the Midwest too. And now you add the LA market, which is probably the most sought after market. In, in the country, I mean, it makes sense. And they've really and truly probably got a discount because, as we know, it's this works the same way NBA contracts do or mm-hmm. NFL quarterback contracts do. The next guy always sets the market. So I can only imagine what the SEC's next deal is going to be after they re-up it. And I think it's like seven years is what they signed with ESPN. But they're, the TV deal for the Big Ten, just to put it in perspective, is bigger than the entire TV deal for the entire NHL. <laughs> And almost bigger than MLB's TV deal. So this is the, and I don't, I'm not surprised because college football, as we both know, is one of the hottest sports in terms of mm-hmm. t- people, people watching. Yeah. I, I think it's just going to keep growing higher and higher. I think they got a discount. I love that they went and got Peacock and NBC because now you've got Notre Dame's two biggest rivals. You have Notre Dame's TV network. Why wouldn't they come? And, and, and the longevity of things. So mm-hmm. I, I really like the Big Ten's move, and I think they just keep setting the market, man. They, that is as much credit as the SEC gets for dominating the football field. The Big Ten gets all the credit in the world for dominating the negotiation table and the business aspect of things because they've been the leaders of this across college football. And I was really impressed that they got this put together. But let's be honest, they probably got a steal, especially if they start adding some more teams. Yeah, it's it's the rich get richer pretty much right now for the Big Ten. And, yeah, it's just like it seems like the Big Ten is just going to get as much teams as they I know there was talks about them getting North Carolina a few years ago. There's probably even talks about them getting Clemson, even though I think if Clemson did jump conferences, it would be the SEC. But it is interesting. And you also mentioned where college football is is very popular here in the States. It's probably ranked number two, to be honest with you, behind the NFL. And it's probably over the NBA. It's over the MLB. It's over the NHL. It's just crazy how much college football is, you know, it's just watching it just it's literally the number two sport, even though it is football, but it's it's college football. So and it, it's basically also the developmental league to the NFL, really, if you think about it. So um, anyways, though, but USC and UCLA uh, jumping ship to the Big Ten. Um, 
did did this did this really surprise you or what did yeah did did, did this just did this surprise you? I think it surprised everybody. If you would have mm. if if you just took a time machine back to like six seven years ago, and I and I came on your show, let's say it was around. And I said, USC UCLA is going to play in the Big Ten in six, seven years. You would have been like, I don't never invite you back on the show ever again. This dude is out of his mind. And I mean, it, it's following the money. I forgot what the exact number was, but UCLA paid off their entire debt just based off like what the TV deal potentially could be. Mm-hmm. And it, when you look at that type of money, people mention the travel. And, and that's fine. But when you're making as much money as some of these schools are and are backed by the boosters that these schools are, that doesn't matter. Do you don't you don't think UCLA can afford to fly the women's basketball team to Maryland on a Wednesday night? Yes. You know, the school's going to take some hits in terms of, you know, people missing classes and things. But financially, it's all about the money. And the Big Ten made a good offer. And let's let's be honest, the Pac-12 uh, just moved, uh, just switched commissioners, what, last summer? last summer, mm-hmm. And they've made some really bad deals. The TV deal's atrocious. The Pac-12 network was a bust. The conference has been unstable since the end of the USC dynasty. If, if I'm any of the other Pac-12 schools, I'm, I know they've been in talks with Oregon and Washington. If I'm Oregon, I am trying to kick down the door. I'm sending... I'm sending Phil Knight and Nike money. I'm sending everyone I can to say, please don't leave me here and what's left over with the Pac-12. So I don't think conference realignment's over, but I think everyone's shocked just because no one ever foresaw what the money would be in college football a few years ago. But now with conference realignment, I can't blame any of the schools for jumping for that money. Because if you told me if I had an organization, a college football program, and you told me I was might make $100 million just off of TV revenue, I'm signing that dotted line mm-hmm. easily. Yeah, I mean it's pretty it's pretty a pretty easy decision for both USC and UCLA, and especially with the Pac-12 being um, just not as good as or not as dominant as because because back in the 2000s when USC was dominant, they were one of the top conferences. I mean, they were still a top five or power five conference, and technically they're still that power five conference, but it seems like now more than ever they're starting to lose it. But um, also, too, with Notre Dame, uh, there have been talks about them joining the Big Ten. And it's interesting because I think most sports, they're in the ACC, which yeah. the Big Ten makes more sense, right? Because they're in Indiana. That's more of a Midwest region. But as we've just mentioned, it's not really about regions anymore. Um, do you think the Big Ten would be a better? Well, it looks like it's going to be a better option. But do you think Notre Dame goes to the Big Ten in football? And then what would they do elsewhere? Would they have to move in the Big Ten in every sport? Or what's what's that, what's going to happen with Notre Dame? I think that would be the deal. I don't think you would just try to bring Notre Dame football over. Mm-hmm. I, I would imagine they would bring all their sports over, and I don't think they would have an issue doing that if the money was right and it made it made sense to the administration. I think Notre Dame has been fine being its own brand in college football, but I think when you're looking at the landscape of where things are going with a potential power two, power three, whatever you want to call it, or just a power five breaking away, it's way too risky, even if you're Notre Dame to be out on your own somewhere Mm -hmm. in terms of a football program. So I think the Big Ten, whether it's this year, two years from now, three years from now, I think Notre Dame's ultimate home is going to be the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. And if, like I said, you mentioned too, you think that all sports are going to, you know, eventually going to leave the ACC and go to the Big Ten. Um, Do you think it's a good idea? I know you just kind of mentioned too that it's probably a better idea to just stay or just go to the Big Ten instead of just staying as an independent brand. But what happens if Notre Dame decides not to go to the Big Ten, which it, that would be crazy, especially right now with what it's looking like? Could they could they base could they still be uh, a, could they still stay in the uh, being an independent and still being good? I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, I, I don't think it's going to impact the talent on the field that they're getting. Is mm-hmm. it still going to be Notre Dame? They still hired a great coach and Marcus Freeman. They got a great staff, and it's still the brand of Notre Dame. But I think when it when you look at being independent, are they going to get a solo TV deal that rivals anything compared to what they would even be getting as a cut of the Big Ten? I I don't know if you can you could say that. And I don't think I think it's going to come down to how hard the ACC pushes, which I think is going to be really hard. Mm-hmm. But are they going to compete with the offer that the Big Ten is going to throw at them? And I just don't know if that's the case because because a lot of people are going to say, okay, why would you want to leave the ACC in basketball? And that's fine. You got Duke, UNC. We know what the 
st- statuses in the ACC, you got some really successful basketball teams too. Michigan, Michigan State's historically great. Ohio State has had some success in the tournament. Like you still have really good brands. Maryland basketball has been really good as well. So I don't think you're taking a big step back. I mean, I think Iowa was what a number two seed last year or three seed. And, and Wisconsin's been good. I, Minnesota's made the tournament. So I don't think the basketball is going to be enough to keep them in the ACC. If the ACC does not throw the same offer or even a similar offer at them that the that the Big Ten is potentially going to, I don't see how they're going to stay in the ACC, even with all the other sports already being tied into the conference. Yeah, I mean, it, make, it makes sense for Notre Dame, I think, to go to the Big Ten and just kind of move every sport they can to the conference. And speaking of the ACC, um, it seems like ACC is kind of, if you're not a Clemson or if you're not a Miami or if you're not North Carolina, you're kind of feel like kind of screwed because those teams could move to a different conference like the SEC or Big Ten. But do you think Clemson stays in the ACC or the top teams? Or what do you think is going to happen with the ACC overall? I think it depends on what the top teams do because i think when you look at that conference you have a lot of ties in other sports Mm -hmm. duke and unc are not splitting up let's just put that out there they are going to the same conference you have you know the florida states of miami's where 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 could they potentially fit in you have Mm -hmm. louisville kind of sitting out there in the in the state of kentucky could that be an sec target and it's just it's a weird geographical conference too where it's like could the northern teams all go to the big 10 could the southern teams all go to the sec but i think until the clemson florida states unc's i'm even throwing duke in there because of basketball Mm -hmm. until those teams make a move i don't see the i don't see the other teams in the acc really bolting now we know that unc and some of these teams florida state have had potential conversations with both the big 10 and sec but until a national brand makes a move i don't expect the rest of the acc to really have it foresee what's going to happen. I think they're just going to kind of try to stay put the best they can and kind of see what happens with the landscape of college football. And what what do you think is going to happen with the teams in the big 12 and the, and the, and the, uh, and the pack 12. So say there's what eight teams remaining left or eight or 10 teams left in the pack 12 and say there's, I mean, I know the um, big 12 just lost Texas and Oklahoma, but they got a bunch of teams in Houston, UCF, um, Cincinnati and um, BYU. Do you think there's a chance that the two conferences merge or what, what do you think is going to happen there? I think a merger is possible. I think you also could see the Mountain West kind of get robbed, maybe the top of the mm-hmm. Sun Belt or something like that. Because, um, you know, I, I think when you look at how conferences are not really looking at geography anymore, those Appalachian states are looking real nice over there Mm -hmm. um, who are very, very successful. Louisiana Lafayette, potentially. I think even a Boise state, a San Jose, a San Jose state has been successful, a Fresno state potentially. So I think those top teams could potentially be picked off by either the big 12 and, or the PAC 12. But if that doesn't happen, I think a merger is probably the only way they're going to keep up with what the big 10 sec are doing. But right now they're being really left behind due to bad TV deals and also a leadership structure that doesn't seem as almost cutthroat in terms of making moves as some of the other conferences. Yeah, and it kind of seems like some of those teams are in no man's land, as we kind of mentioned. Um, but we'll see what happens with all those teams. And it's definitely going to be entertaining to see what happens in the next two or three years or even the next year, because with what happened, and it's kind of all started with Texas and Oklahoma bolting for the SEC. And it's going to be weird, though, that last year, because I think in 2023 or 2024 is when those four teams, uh, Houston, BYU, UCF, and um, – Oh, why am I going blank now? Those uh, four teams, it's Houston, UCF, uh, BYU. Cincinnati. And, oh, Cincinnati, yep. It's going to be interesting, too, because the Big 12 is going to have 14 teams for that one year. So that's going to be interesting, and I wonder how they're going to do the divisions there. But uh, we'll see. We can kind of talk about that if we have time at the end of the interview. So um, Nick Saban just got an extension, and everybody knew that he was going to stay put, right? That's probably where he's going to retire. Um, but he's probably still a long time before retiring. Um, the extension Saban signs, I mean, we we all knew it was well-deserved, right? He's probably the greatest, col- greatest college football coach of all time. I mean, he's got the championships. But uh, how many years do you think Saban has left? And do you think the contract um, – do you, or just how, how, many years le- how many years do you think Saban has left? Uh, as many as he wants. I mean, he hasn't had any health issues. He still looks like mm-hmm. he can do it, right? I mean, he's not losing any momentum on the recruiting trail. You know, when you look at – 
some of the older coaches, especially toward the end of their tenure, either they started having health issues and it kind of forced them to take a step back and or they lost touch with the current college football game. They really were losing pace mm-hmm. on recruiting. They were not doing as well coaching and the team started to de- to hit a downward you know, trajectory. I don't see that at all with Alabama. They're still landing mm-hmm. all the five yeah. stars they want. They're still getting the national championships, winning SEC championships. Until I see something otherwise, I'm giving Nick Saban the benefit of the doubt. He can coach for as long as he wants to. Of course, age will catch up to him. But I think for right now, unless some some unforeseen circumstance occurs, I think you've got him for at least another five to six years. Mm-hmm. And what did what did you think about the contract overall? I should have asked that first. But what did you think about the contract? It, it's, it's a steal. Mm-hmm. Whatever. If I'm Alabama, and I, if you're any school, and Nick Saban came to you and said, listen, I, I want to coach for you. You hand them the blank check with the pen and say, write what you, write what you need. I, I already got my signature on it and take it to the bank and deposit it. That That's it. That, that's all the questions you need to ask because he, what he's done at Alabama is spectacular. When you look at the evolution from 09, that first national championship, to last season when they, when they got to the national championship and came up just short against Georgia, the teams don't even look the same. And the way he's been able to do what a lot of coaches haven't, and that's evolve and find some sort of longevity, which in a sport and in a career that longevity is not common and longevity is really hard to find. He's been able to overcome everything and, and be, in my opinion, I don't even know if it's a debate. I, when you, when you list the greatest college football head coaches, you put Nick Saban and then put them to the side at one and we can debate two through 10. That's, that's how that list goes in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, is there and we all know Alabama's most likely going to make the college football playoff. Right. But is there any way they don't make the college football playoff? Because I feel like that's a, that's like one um, in a million chance injuries. I think that would be the only thing to knock them off is mm-hmm. injuries or some, something unforeseen. I think when you look at this team top to bottom, they are the most talented team in college football. They, they're the number one team in the country. And the fact that you had the best offensive player in the country, a Heisman winner, Bryce Young, come back at quarterback. And you had the best defensive player in the country, and Will Anderson come back as well. Uh, what else? Do, what else could you possibly want? That mm-hmm. never happens anymore in college football. And and when you go into the transfer portal and land a, and land one of the top running backs in the country in Jameer Gibbs, you go and reload at wide receiver after you've just lost um, Jamison Williams. You reload in the secondary. You reload on the offensive line. Where yeah, you know you lost Evan Neal and some guys, but you had all five stars behind them and they were all really talented guys coming Mm -hmm. out of high school, Alabama, in my opinion, unless something just insane happens, they're making the college football playoff. And ultimately I think there should be the easy favorite to win the national championship. And yeah, you mentioned Bryce Young, of course he won the Heisman last year and that wasn't much of a secret. I mean, he played great. He was unbelievable last year Um, and he's coming back and he, he, this is most likely going to be his last year and he's probably going to be the number one pick it's very hard for Heisman's to win back to back because there's only been one in history and there was a few that could have won back to back, but they didn't. Right. Do you think there's a, or what do you, what would you say about price young winning the Heisman again? I mean, do you think there's a better chance or do you kind of think that it's going to be like normal years where voters don't like to vote for the same guy two years in a row? It'll probably be that. I think they're probably not going to want I mean, you saw it last year. They didn't even want two players at the Heisman ceremony. They let Aiden Hutchinson steal, criminally steal, a spot from Will Anderson. It wasn't even a debate who the better player was, statistically and or talent-wise. They stole that spot from Will Anderson just because they didn't want to seem like they had an Alabama bias. Um, unless Bryce Young goes out there and puts up a year like Joe Burrow, I, I don't think he's going to win it. I think he'll be a mm-hmm. finalist. Most likely it'll be kind of like that second Tim Tebow year, but they're not going to give it to him. I think when you look at just how Alabama's viewed and media wise, the Southern voters will vote for him. But as we know, it's broken up by a region, the Midwest, the North, the Northwest and the Northeast voters will not give him the vote. And some of them might exclude him from the ballot altogether just because they don't want to give it to another Alabama guy twice. And it's even hard too to go back to the ceremony two years in a row. I think uh, uh, Lamar Jackson did that. I'm trying to remember. Joe, most of the quarterbacks have been older, so I think Lamar Jackson is Sean Watson. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he went what three or twice? Twice. Yeah, fifteen. He went to the ceremony twice. I think he was a three time. Like he was on the voting three times. Yeah, that that's incredible. And I think he came up third and then second. Yes, he should have won that one year, uh, in my opinion, but. Well, I mean, you're, you're talking to a Lamar Jackson fan, so yeah. we can debate that a little later. But uh, 
And, you know, it, it is a little different, too. And Bryce Young seems like he's going to be the number one pick, as I just mentioned. But uh, we'll see what happens. And do you have a Heisman prediction? I know it's really early. Um, and I think we talked about this last time you came on. But who do you think could, outside of Bryce Young, who do you think could go to uh, New York this uh, this this season? Uh, CJ CJ Stroud, just because, man, mm-hmm. the voters are so biased to quarterbacks. It, and the fact that he – had such a great year if he puts up similar stats and they got a great wide receiving core i wouldn't be surprised if cj strauss the favorite now will anderson is such an interesting case for mm-hmm. me because we when you look at some of the defensive players that people have argued you look at chase young um you look at aiden hutchinson you look at nadama Sue in 2009 none of those players had another year of eligibility after they you know were mm-hmm. in the top five Will Anderson comes back with all the hype. There's people who think he was who was slighted, a, a, aka me as well. And if he goes out there, I mean, you've got to look at him at the DN edge spot. Had a hundred plus tackles, thirty plus tackles for loss, and almost twenty sacks last year. What if he hits that twenty sack mark and has another thirty plus tackle for loss year and hits a hundred tackles again? Man, what else does a defensive player need to do? Mm-hmm to win that award. And so I think Will Anderson's an interesting case. And there's a sleeper up in Pullman, Washington, that I want everyone to know his name, and it's Cameron Ward, court, transfer quarterback to Washington State. Now, he's coming from the FCS level. He was a FCS All-American last year, was the Jerry Rice Award winner in the spring season, which is given to the best freshman of the year, was a finalist for the Walter Payton Award, which is given to the best offensive player in FCS football. This is a guy who was under-recruited. He ran the um, wing T offense in high school. So he threw like 50 passes his entire high school career. Goes to Incarnate Word, comes out last season, throws almost 50 touchdowns and almost 5,000 yards. And he he's teaming up with his, with his former head coach, who's now the OC at Washington State. So he doesn't have to learn the offense. They already know each other, and he gets an upgrade at wide receiver and all these talent positions at the FBS level. Cameron Ward is the type of guy who could emerge like a Joe Burrow and just have a ridiculous year out of nowhere. And I'm telling you, he has all the accolades. He was, just to kind of give you a a perspective, he was ranked a top five player in the transfer portal from the FCS level, above Bo Nix, a former five-star, just as high as Caleb Williams, who was a former five-star. That's how much the scouts love him. I'm telling you, Cameron Ward is a sleeper up in Washington State. That's that's an interesting one, and I, you know, honestly, I didn't really hear much about him. But yeah, that's another uh, another good uh, sleeper pick, right? And uh, speaking of sleepers, um, I know this is we're running out of or we're running a bit out of time, so I don't want to uh, run this over here. But uh, do you have three sleeper teams? And it can be from any type of conference. It can be from the same conference. But do you have three sleeper teams um, that could possibly emerge oh. as a make to the college football playoff? Hmm. You see, it's so tough because you know I, I was I was doing a show the other day and asked this question. It for me, anyone below like three is a sleeper because mm-hmm. like everyone's just looking at Ohio State, Georgia, um, Alabama running away with this. I, I've been really high on this team. They're a top ten team, even though they're a sleeper. But the brand is something I think is keeping them in that sleeper spot, and that's Utah. Mm. I really, really like Utah this year. They bring back um, their leading rusher. They bring back their quarterback. Kyle Whittingham, to me, has been the most overlooked head coach in in college football just Mm -hmm. because he coaches at Utah. And we know that unless you're a big national brand, you don't get the respect. But they get to go to the swamp week one against Florida on the road. And we know even though Florida probably isn't going to win the SEC, getting a road win against an SEC school counts a lot in the Mm -hmm. voters' eyes. If they can go down there and get that win, that's big. And they get a really good San Diego State team as their group of five game as well san diego state has been known to knock some people off but if cam rising could take that step forward they can find a way to replace um i'm blanking uh, uh devin at the linebacker spot devin lloyd if they can just replace that one spot man this team is almost completely coming back and so i really i know a lot of people are so high on usc man i understand it they get all this great talent i think utah in my opinion can go out there Went, go undefeated, one loss, get to the college football playoffs. And everyone's going to say it's because certain players opted out for Ohio State, but Utah wasn't fully healthy for that Rose Bowl either. And they went toe to toe, scoring 40 plus points with Ohio State in a very competitive Rose Bowl. I'm telling you, I'm really, really excited for Utah. Now, the other, another team is Baylor. 
Mm-hmm. I think Baylor, in my opinion, is getting overlooked as well. It's the same reason that Utah is getting overlooked is there's a new team in town getting a lot of hype, and that's Texas. They get – you know, Steve Sarkeesian year two, they land Quinn Ewers, but John Robinson's coming back. And we know the narrative every year, Texas is back every single year. We're all excited about Texas potentially, you know, can, can they be the Texas that me and you grew up watching? I think Baylor, in my opinion, with everything they're returning is going to play spoiler to that. I think when you look at what Dave Aranda's built, he has, he's one of the greatest defensive minds in college football, in my opinion, they have a really, really good chance to re- to go back to the Big 12 championship. They have a tough road game against BYU that they're going to have to overcome. They got road games against Oklahoma and Texas and Iowa State. But I really – I don't know what to make of Oklahoma, man. I really think Oklahoma could be the most overrated team in the country yeah. just because of – all the all the losses, but Blake Shapin comes back at quarterback. Uh, Connor Galvin and that defensive line and that defense offensive line group are both going to be really good. And one thing you could say about Dave Aranda, when he faces the spread, he gives head coaches he gives other head coaches fits. And I think he's going to be a guy who is going to really give that Texas offense some problems. When you look at Lincoln Riley at USC, and we talked about his high-flying offenses, three of the top four worst performances for that offense, uh, high-flying offense, was against Dave Aranda. And I think he has the ability to really shut down that great Texas attack you see. And my last one is a team I don't think anyone's talking about, and that's North Carolina. They had a lot of hype two years ago, and I think everyone's saying, oh, they lost Sam Howell. We know what they lost at the running back spot and at the wide receiver spot um, over the past two years. Josh Downs is back. I think he's a top 10 receiver in college football. Drake May steps into the quarterback spot, and people may forget this. This is a kid who was a top 50, top 55 player in his class, depending on the, the recruiting service you'd like to use. He flipped from Alabama to UNC. So this is a guy who Nick Saban was recruiting to be the guy after Bryce Young. He goes in a Mac Brown offense with Josh Downs at the wide receiver spot. The offensive line's revamped. They got a five-star tackle in Rice. Um, I'm blanking on his first name, but three five-stars on the defensive line. They get a five-star corner in Tony Grimes coming back for his third season. Storm Ducks on the other side. If they can find some safety help, this UNC team could be a real sleeper in the ACC, and I think if they can get hot early and rally off some wins, they open their season this weekend against Florida A&M, and we're going to get to kind of see what this team looks like. I'm really excited for UNC, but those will probably be my three sleeper teams. All right. Again, thanks for coming on, Zach. Again, um, don't forget to check out the Blue Bloods College Football Podcast. The links will be down in the description below. Again, I can't thank you enough for coming on again, Zach, and talking about a preview of the uh, 2022 college football season. It's going to be exciting, especially with all with how big the offseason was and even into last year as well. So, again, thanks for coming on, Zach, and um, enjoy the football season. Hopefully I can have you on before or sometime during the football or college football season. So, again, okay. thanks for coming on. And um, enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, man. The STP Sports Lightning Round. Your biggest sports stories in the world this past week. The 2022 MLB Draft took place at Los Angeles, California during All-Star Week. I forgot to do this a few weeks ago and I, because I thought I had already done it, but this is why it's a little bit late, just because I forgot. Uh, The Baltimore Orioles had the top pick. The Dodgers were the only team without a first rounder as their top pick was dropped 10 places to 40th overall for exceeding the luxury tax last year. Baltimore had the number one pick and selected Jackson Holiday, the son of former World Series champion Matt Holiday. Jackson Holiday is from Stillwater High School and plays shortstop. The Diamondbacks had the very next pick and selected Drew Jones, outfielder out of Wesleyan High School in Georgia. The Rangers had the third pick and took right-handed pitcher Kamar Rocker from Vanderbilt. The Pirates had the fourth pick and drafted Tamar Johnson, shortstop from Benjamin E. Mays High School in Georgia. The Washington Nationals had the fifth pick and selected Elijah Green, outfielder from IMG Academy in Florida. The Marlins had the next pick and took Jacob Berry, a third baseman slash outfielder from the University of LSU. The Chicago Cubs had the seventh pick and drafted Cade Horton, pitcher from the University of Oklahoma. The Minnesota Twins had the eighth pick and took shortstop Brooks Lee from Cal Cal Poly University. The next team with the pick was the Kansas City Royals and they drafted Gavin Cross, outfielder from Virginia Tech. And last but not least, the Colorado Rockies rounded out the top 10 
and drafted Gabriel Hughes, right-handed pitcher from the University of Georgia. This officially rounds up the top 10 in this year's MLB draft. In this year's draft, there were there were two players in the top 10 that had fathers that had played in the MLB. That was Jackson Holliday, whose father was Matt Holliday, and Drew Jones, whose father was Andrew Jones. All right, that's the show. Can't thank you enough for listening to the Sports Town Podcast. We really appreciate it. Check us out on Instagram and Facebook at Sportstown underscore podcast or on Twitter at Sportstown Pod. We release new episodes every week. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful day. Here's some independent music to send you into the greatest week of all time. to the Sports Town Podcast, or the STP Pod for short. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and much more. Also, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sports Town Podcast. If you want to check out more videos of the Sports Town Podcast, click on the right.